John Adams, Letters from the Front podcast for December 1915. This podcast looks at life in World War I through the letters of John Adams, who was 23 when he joined in September 1914. He served with the 9th Service Battalion Royal Irish Fusiliers and was involved in many significant events on the Western Front, particularly Passchendaele. These are his words, read by his grandchildren and narrated by his great-grandchildren. This month being December, it was John Adams' first Christmas in the trenches. And we do get a view of this, both from a letter from John uh, to his mother, but also a letter from his sister Jeannie to his mother. Now, John was quite gentle with his mother about what was happening. But when John wrote to Jeannie, he told her a lot more about it. And of course, Jeannie went and told the mother. My daughter Charlotte read the Jeannie letter and it was interesting talking to her about what life would be like in the trenches in those time and she was quite a lovely insight into the history of life in the trenches. We also have a letter from G. We know nothing about who this G is. It's a letter to John. We don't even know if G is male or female. Some of the letter may suggest that they're coming out of uh, the trenches. Other parts of the letter suggest it, it is a woman. So uh, for the sake of the podcast, I have had my wife read out the letter, so it's a female voice, but really we don't know much about G. Lastly, we continue on with our discussion with myself and my two brothers, John and Roger, about our trip that we had last year to the Western Front, and we continue this time with our history bit talking about Bandagem. There were a series of field hospitals with crazy names like Bandagem, Mendingham, very much a humour of the war. And we start off by discussing how Roger worked out where Bandagem, the field hospital John Adams went to, how he found that. One of the other places we visited was a wee uh, side trip that Roger brought us on to Bandagem Cemetery. Do you want to talk a wee bit about that? Yeah, that was uh, that was really interesting. It was a good start to the trip because uh, we visited it on the way through to Ypres. We know that Grander was wounded in 1918, in October 1918, and they had shrapnel's right thigh. We have the telegram uh, sent to his mother, and it says in the te- telegram that he was at the third Australian casualty clearing station. I know that we research and discovered that this casualty clearing station had been sighted uh, at Howing, just into Belgium, at the date of Grander being wounded. So it turned out that uh, at all these hospitals, at all these casualty clearing stations, there there were cemeteries. And so there's a cemetery there now, which uh, which is called Harring Bandagem. And that was really, really moving, because uh, there were gravestones there from soldiers from his, his regiment, the 9th Royal Irish Fusiliers, wounded and then obviously died days after Grander was himself wounded. I was going to say dodged a bullet there. He didn't, but... Uh, <laughs> he survived and others didn't. <laughs> yeah. But uh, what, what amazed me was you've got all these beautifully kept cemeteries, all these wee tiny places just in the middle of nowhere. And you do have to do your research before you go out. Yeah. You know, I was discussing these cemeteries just the other day. I was discussing the whole post-World War I memorialization of it and how coordinated it is. It's, it's extraordinary from... Uh, the people who design the cemeteries, they're all the same. They're all the same. They're all really well kept first by the Imperial War uh, Cemeteries people and, and now the Commonwealth War Graves Commission. And it, it, it's just astonishing how cogent it is, how mm-hmm. holistic it is, the whole thing from the cenotaph out to the cemeteries and so on. Yeah. I read a book about it recently, about the whole process uh, that the, the cemeteries started being planned right back in 1914 or 1915. Um, and the, the whole, all the decisions that were made all the way through about, you know, they, they wouldn't repatriate the bodies like they do today. Um, although those who are rich could probably have afforded to have bodies repatriated where there was a body. Yeah. And they decided to have things like all the gravestones are the same size. There's going to be limited scope for any difference in them. The only difference was around religion uh, and regiment, really, with a little space for each of the families to write something. Yeah, at the bottom of them. And some yeah. families chose to do that and some didn't. Yeah, yeah. And if you actually look at the Commonwealth War Graves, War Graves Commission website, you can actually see the original manifests for when they made all the graves. And they'd written to the families. You can get addresses for some of the families who'd written in. Um, 
it's quite it's quite an amazing resource actually. Hmm. The medieval town of Ypres was located at the centre of the 1914-1918 battlefields of the Ypres Salient. The British were associated with Ypres throughout the war and involved in all four battles which bear the name of the town. The town was almost constantly under bombardment and was reduced to ruins during four years of fighting. Uh, when we went there, we stayed in Ypres, and I think we've decided we'd call it Ypres instead of <laughs> there. Uh, being a foreign language, it may not be our forte, but we stayed fairly near the centre, within walking distance, certainly. Outside the cloth hall, huge, big, almost a, a town square, shops all around it, and quite a beautiful place. And within the cloth uh, hall itself, a museum dedicated to the First World War, but a town that went through quite a turnaround from being almost completely destroyed in the First World War up to now, where it, even without First World War tourism, it's a very beautiful place to visit. Mm. Well, you know that uh, Churchill um, proposed that Ypres, Ypres or Ypres be um, be left in ruins as a memorial for the uh, for the fallen, um, and thankfully that was overruled and common sense prevailed. And actually reconstructing somewhere and seeing that places can actually come come out of of war and be reconstructed and get back to a peaceful state is is actually quite a quite a good thing. Dashi said something that Europe, which is riven by centuries of war between different parts of Europe, whether it be France and Britain or Germany and France or whatever, has now had peace for over 75 years. And a lot of that's due to the fact that people were scarred by 78 million people being killed in the two world wars and deciding that actually a fundamental modern society needs to be, first of all, at peace. I I think it's good that Ypres is a really good place for this sort of post-conflict reconstruction. It's hard to imagine how you'd leave a, a place like that almost completely obliterated and maintain it like that as a memorial because inevitably it would overgrow and all the rest of the people yeah. are living there. And I think the, the French, the French is far more uh, effective. Yeah, the, the yeah. French did it for a couple of villages in the, after the Second World War where all the citizens were murdered by the by the Nazis. And there's a couple of villages in France which are just left as ruins. Yes, and of course the Menin Gate is there, which every night they have a, a remembrance ceremony. And at every night it's hundreds of people, it's crowded, bunged, which is quite striking itself. That was the gate where you'd march out of, and the joke was the last one out closes the gate. <laughs> yes, <laughs> so this ruined flattened town. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a very moving ceremony. Uh, it happens every night. Uh, I've had the privilege of seeing it twice, and uh, both times it moves me to tears. Because the walls are completely covered with the names of soldiers for whom there's no known grave. There's no body. Uh, they've not been found. Inside uh, and every Inside and out. Uh, I mean, it's a massive structure with these names on. And, and every night, uh, last post is prayed, wreaths are laid and proper respect is given and that has been happening virtually every night since yeah what's striking of course is the date that they stopped inscribing the date they chose to stop inscribing names on the men and gate and start inscribing names on tyne cot memorial was the date that grander was involved in passchendaele is that right yeah wow i had not realized that Tyne Cot Cemetery is the resting place of 11,954 soldiers of the Commonwealth Forces. This is the largest number of burials contained in any Commonwealth cemetery of either the First or Second World War. It is the largest Commonwealth military cemetery of the world. The dates of death of the soldiers buried at Tyne Cot Cemetery cover a period of four years from October 1914 to September 1918 inclusive. This time Cot, which we also visited, is the largest military cemetery in Europe, I believe. Hmm. It's jaw-dropping in scale. Again, yes, thousands and thousands of names on the, on the walls for those who don't have a grave there. Hmm. I think that's the one I just couldn't do anymore, Pat. Field postcard, 5th of December, 
1915. I am quite well. I received your letter dated the 1st of December 1915. Letter follows at first opportunity. Field postcard, 10th December 1915. I am quite well. I received your letter dated 6th of December 1915. Letter follows at first opportunity. Postmark, Field Post Office 108, 18th December 1915. Also marked past censor number 2524 and appears to be signed by R.S. Hood. Postmark shows souvenir from France. A soldier rests holding his rifle as a staff and resting his arm on his knee. He dreams of his sweetheart at home who in turn thinks of him. 16th December 1915 Dear Mother, I received your letter last night and glad to know you have got quite all right again, hoping all at home are in the usual good health as it leaves me at the same at present. The weather still keeps wet, but I think it is the same all over. All at present, we'll write later, J. Adams. 19th December 1915, somewhere in France. My dear mother, I am sorry that I have been so long in writing to you, but I could not help it. I received your letter and card. Many thanks for seeing. I am glad you liked the little card I sent. They are a rare thing out here and we would give any money for them. And I tell you, the French people know how to put the price on them when they know that you want them. You need not be a bit sorry at not being able to send me a parcel for Christmas, for I think I've had my share of them. I had two from Jeannie and two from Lois Morton and one from Mrs. McKee and Christmas cards from the world over. I had also a letter from Mr. Torrey saying that he had got one of my photos and how glad he was to get it, also giving me great praises for what I call nothing but doing my duty. Jeannie was telling me about the book she sent you and got that little piece of paper that is the section that I am in charge of number three. Jack is also in it. So we are always together, and I hope we may get home together, but I am afraid of it this time, as I will have to toss up for it this time. I do not want to give you too much hope, but if all goes well, and we are spared, we might get a race home in the new year. But it's only might, no more. I think Jimmy might write and let me know how all is going. He did not happen to tell us that he had a dance in Nokovan in connection with the black number, but we got tickets for it out here. I think it would not have done him much harm to let us know as we used to belong to it at one time. Today is fine and there is a change for we have had very cold and wet weather the last while, but I believe they are having snow in Warm Point, and I hope it does not come our way, as God knows we are bad enough without it. We are likely to take our Christmas dinner in the trenches this year, but we are as contented as well there as any place. In fact, I would rather be in them as out of them, as the time passes much more quickly. I am glad you've got all right again, but the weather is against you getting well quickly. Tell Annie I will write to her soon. I got her card and handkerchief. Many thanks to her for the same. I think I must draw to a close as we are on duty today. I have no more. Thus, you can excuse this scribble. I will write soon again. I am sending you a little piece of paper with Queen Mary's handwriting on it that we got in a pair of mittens just as a keepsake from France. I remain your loving son, John Adams. Field Postcard 20th December 1915 I am quite well. I received your letter dated 16th of December 1915. Letter follows first opportunity. Postmark none enclosed in a letter. Dated 22nd December 1915. Balvaig. Postcard shows Forget me not. God be with you till we meet again. Ships and trains may take away, but friendship and love with us will always stay. A card showing a map of Australia in the centre. Above, two hands, a man and a woman, hold each end of a knotted cord. The card also shows a ship and a train, which is decorated with glitter. The message is surrounded by a number of X kiss marks and a return address of Messrs Finchley, York Street. My dear John, 
Just a line hoping you are quite well and safe. I hope you will excuse if I have got a very bad hand. I am in pain with it, so this is just a few lines to let you know I am still thinking about you. It is near Christmas now. The time is working up until we are going home. I won't be sorry. I am fed up with this life. Well, I will say goodbye for the present, hoping to hear from you soon. Goodbye, dear. I am yours to a sender all. G. Church Hill, Hollywood, County Down, 22nd December 1915. Dear Mother, this is just a wee line to say I am sending you these things. I'm sorry I have not got more to send. I hope this wee shawl will please you. The next size was 7 shillings 6 pence. It was too dear just now. I hope you will put it on and wear it. I will get you a new one when it's done. I had a long letter from Johnny yesterday. He is well and enjoying all the parcels. He wrote a very nice letter to Mrs Trimble thanking for her for the trench cooker. Mr Trimble said they were the two nicest letters he had ever read. They think the light of him is not living. He said he, w- he was thankful for all the parcels. He was gladdest to see the trench ointment than all I sent. It kills the vermin and cools their skin. They say their shirts are just living and they are overrun with rats. I saw in the paper where they sent 2,000 dogs from Paris up to the trenches. He says sometimes they sleep in hay lofts, sometimes in gateways, but he says the people have been better to him since he went away than ever they were before. He had a long letter from Mr. Tovey and Sissy Morton sent him a parcel but it was, was lost on the way. He will be very lonely this Christmas. He says Jack and Jay McCulloch and he are together all the time. He says they all had this tea together as soon as my parcels arrived. I am glad I can help to ease their burden a wee bit. I had a letter from wee John Mater on Sunday. He said he's going to write to his granny again for she is lonely. I sent him a nice book. I hope he won't tear it. I gave Minnie Crozier a nice wee pair of shoes and socks for the baby and a big ball for Samuel. She was awfully pleased. She was not bad to Johnny. She is always glad to see me. She's never long in getting a drop of tea ready anyway. Now I think this is all. I hope you are better. Johnny says if anything was to happen to you, he does not know what he would do. I must tell you, I hear today that Mr Chambers and Mr Archer are both leaving their churches. I heard they were going to America to start business. If it is true, I think it is a shame. Tell Annie I am sorry I have not much for her. She might be able to wear this blouse if they were washed. Would the colour be any good in you? I hope she will like the wee handkerchief. I hope Jimmy will like the cigarettes. I am sorry I have nothing better, but I have put all the money I had in Johnny's parcel. I think he needs all we can give him. I hope you will excuse this scribble. I hope you will be able to read this, but I am in a hurry. It will be a lovely Christmas for us all this time, but God has been good to Johnny so far and I hope he will bring him home safe. I wish you all a Merry Christmas. I hope the new year will bring brighter than last year's. With best love, I remain your loving daughter, Jeannie, right soon. Field Postcard, 27th December 1915 I am quite well. I received your letter dated 20th and 23rd December 1915. Letter follows first opportunity. Thank you for listening to John Adams' Letters from the Front podcast. To find out more about John Adams and his family, visit www.johnadams.org.uk forward slash letters. And you can email us with your comments or questions at letters at johnadams.org.uk. You can also follow at J Adams Letters on Twitter. The history of the 9th Service Battalion at Royal Irish Fusiliers during World War I is taken from Blackers Boys. Visit them at www.9thirishfusiliers.co.uk. That's with the number 9, not the letter. The podcast will be published 100 years after the letters were written, so it will be published nearly every month. This has been a Mark's Mass production.